Top 40 Slasher Movies of All Time Creeping Footsteps, Menacing Silence, The Chink of a Metal Blade, Blood Rushing Through Your Veins as a Maniacal Monster Corners You in a Dingy Rundown Setting Sounds familiar? One of horror's most reviled and best-selling subgenres, slasher films, are an indulgence in calculated madness that sends chills down your spine through the sheer body count that only multiplies as the movie progresses. Over the years, the silver screen has introduced countless heinous murderers and heretics to our conscience, hooking us by the throat with their baffling charisma and lunacy-tinged convictions. But the true horror of a slasher flick doesn't lay in the buckets of fake blood that pool around a victim's body or the jump scares orchestrated by the killer. Great slasher films are psychological thrillers turned up to 11. They disturb you to the very core. Mankind's morbid fascination with the act of killing itself is draped with a sickening sense of intimacy that plays on our most primal fears. Sure, most slashers come with a formula. A group of misfit teens who are super oblivious and super turned on for most of the film come into contact with a crazy killer and get picked off one by one till the final girl exacts bloody retribution or escapes the killer's grasp. But the best slasher films take that premise and twist it in such gruesome, shock-inducing ways that they leave you unsure of your own sense of morality. A true iconic slasher film will take you through a range of emotions. It will expose your voyeuristic temptations, penetrate your fear-prone psyche, and drive you insane with the anticipation of death. They'll push your mental resistance for traumatic observation to the brink and force you to confront yourself. At what point do I turn this off? And if I don't, what am I? If you've managed to find this video, we assume you already know the answer to that question. So, without further ado, here's our list of the top 40 slasher movies of all time. Before we go into our explanations, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Halloween, 1978. We thought it would only be appropriate to start off this list with a movie that helped bring the slasher genre to the main stage. Halloween isn't your typical gore fest with a threadbare plotline that showcases gratuitous violence. It is an eerie, silent, restrained offering that plays on your heartstrings at each and every turn. <laughs> Director John Carpenter sprinkled his soul over this film writing, directing, and scoring it to menacing perfection with a small budget of $300,000. Nevertheless, Carpenter's expert manipulation of American urban myths and Celtic festive traditions resulted in this 91-minute long edge-of-the-seat thrill ride that gave America one of its most enduring horror icons. We start the story through the eyes of six-year-old Michael Myers. What looks like a tale of innocent negligence turns into bloody murder as the boy takes his own sister's life on Halloween night in 1963. Fifteen years later, now institutionalized, Myers escapes captivity and returns to Haddonfield, Illinois, to embark on yet another spree of murders. Halloween is, for all intents and purposes, the proto-slasher flick. It sets the template, tone and structure for every movie that follows. The naivete of the protagonist's friends, the killer's stacked body count and the lethal nature of intimacy, it's all there. Jamie Lee Curtis's debut performance cemented her as one of the all-time great screamers of the genre, towing the line between cheer and terror with uncanny brilliance. But its true legacy lies in Myers the white and expressionless mask that hides the malevolent eyes of the non-feeling entity in human skin remains a mainstay in popular culture till date, as it emphasizes the essence of a true slasher, cold, methodical, merciless, and utterly sinister. <laughs> Wrong Turn, 2003. Not Alan B. McElroy's finest moment with a pen, but certainly his goriest. Wrong Turn is director Rob Schmidt's homage to slasher classic The Hills Have Eyes with a dash of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre set against the backdrop of eerie mountainous southeastern America. Chris Flynn, a medical student, is on his way to an important interview when he's forced to take a wrong turn in order to bypass traffic. However, his tires blow out and he's stranded alongside a group of teenage campers. They soon realize that their accidents were no accidents, as they are thrust into survival mode fleeing from three inbred wood dwellers whose eating habits resemble Hannibal Lecter's. 
On the surface, this film seems unimaginative. It hits the same beats as any typical slasher film, the gas station warning, the stranded teenagers, the cabin in the woods, the barbaric killers. Surprisingly, no nudity. What makes it terrifying is the brutality and the grotesque features of the mountain men. Horror makeup master Stan Winston of Friday the 13th fame was pivotal in their creation and has fashioned the stuff of nightmares for this film. The men are disgusting to look at. Emaciated skin, teeth sticking out, hair disheveled, bodies disfigured. Schmidt's masterful camera work gives you shock and awe cinema that manages to convey brutality without actively showing it. It is not a unique offering, but Wrong Turn is a tense, rapid-paced watch that gives you merely seconds to breathe before your heart, like the protagonist's, is on the run again. Please, God. This is God. Nightmare on Elm Street, 1984. One, two, Freddy's coming for you. Wes Craven's nightmarish masterpiece rounds out the trilogy of slasher films that brought the entire genre to mainstream popularity. Carpenter's Halloween was a sinister, brooding production. Cunningham's Friday the 13th, which we'll talk about in a bit, was lecherously frightening. And A Nightmare on Elm Street is a literal fever dream of a movie that draws on some of the most human sources of fear, nightmares. Tina Gray has a nightmare about a disfigured man chasing her through a boiler room trying to kill her. Her friend Nancy has the same dream. It turns out they are connected and to their horrid realization, their nightmares are real. Robert Englund's Freddy Krueger is a cruel piece of work, a near indestructible murderer who exists on the surreal plane of dreams, causing unconscious experiences to result in some very serious consequences. Unlike other slasher antagonists though, Freddy's face is on the display for the whole of the world to see, burnt, mortified, with an iconic fedora and knifed glove outfit that made him seem equal parts cartoonish and terrifying. Schmidt's intimate, unsettling camera work and appetite for brutality, seriously, R.I.P. Glenn, left a lasting impression on the slasher genre itself, influencing every production since. Though the sequels would turn the franchise into a self-aware parody of itself, Craven's original, A Nightmare on Elm Street, still holds up to its reputation of being one of the finest horror slasher flicks of all time. Child's Play Tom Holland, not that one, weaves a capturing tale of murder, mysticism and innocence with this iconic slasher movie that can still give kids nightmares about their dolls coming to life. Co-written by the brilliantly demented mind of Don Mancini, Child's Play is as much a slasher film as it is a psychological thriller that plays with the dangerous consequences of ignorance and the idea that children don't know any better. The movie plays out like a cinematic adaptation of the Twilight Zone's Living Doll episode, albeit with a much bigger appetite for murder and a ghoulish sense of humor. Charles Lee Ray, an occultist and murderer, is gunned down by Deputy Mike Norris, but before he dies, he passes his spirit into a good guy doll. Andy Barclay's mother brings this doll to him for his birthday, but the boy soon discovers his talking companion has a dark secret and no batteries. Chuck is like Fats from the Anthony Hopkins Starer 1978 psychological horror flick Magic, if it gained proper sentience and shared a jail cell with Freddy Krueger. He is vulgar, vicious and viscerally violent to the point it's comical. Brad Dourif's maniacal, obscenity-spewing take on this killer doll made it a pop culture icon, spawning a multi-million dollar franchise and turning Chunky into one of the most recognizable horror characters of all time. Credit also has to be given to Alex Vincent, who is perhaps one of the more underrated child actors of his his era. The sense of innocence he brought to Andy Barclay made Chunky's bloodthirsty nature seem that much more terrifying. <laughs> Hatchet 2006 Here's a film that's sure to find an audience at old school grindhouses. Splatpak member Alan Green made sure to turn up the gorometer to 20 for 2006's Hatchet. Set in the swamps of New Orleans, the movie follows the story of a group of teenagers encountering a murderous entity in the woods. Ben, Joel Moore, and Marcus, Dion Richmond, after attending a rowdy Mardi Gras celebration, decide to go on a haunted swamp tour. However, when their inexperienced swamp guide leaves their group stranded in the woods, they are attacked by a hideous being with superhuman strength and a poncho for gruesome murders. Hatchet is an unabashed love letter to the golden age of slasher films as it immerses itself in everything that makes a genre so iconic, 
a creepy setting, sarcastic witticisms, scantily clad women, and over-the-top bone-chilling violence. Kane Hodder has portrayed many genre-defying slasher characters in his long career, which includes Jason and Leatherface, two of the category's all-time greats. But Victor Crowley tops his list of personal favorite kills, R.I.P. Swamp Pride Lady. The late, great John Carl Brickler made sure that when the audience saw Crowley, there'd be no room for empathy. He is grotesque, monstrous-looking, with bestial ferocity. Although the titular hatchet only ever kills one person in the film, two if you count Mr. Crowley, its threatening aura and tragic backstory are ever-present in the film's 83-minute runtime. Friday the 13th, 1980. The progenitor of the killer at the camp trope and the 80s slasher boom, every slasher film since 1980 has tried to imitate or pay homage to Friday the 13th in script or spirit. You know the story, a freaky camp counselling couple gets murdered in the attic and two years later the cycle begins anew. Friday the 13th is by no means original. In fact, lead writer Victor Miller has admitted in interviews that director and producer Sean S. Cunningham asked him to model the movie after John Carpenter's Halloween. There are many shots in the film that pay direct homage to it, especially the dangling upside-down shot. It is, however, unique in that it takes the premise of murder and pushes the envelope further than Carpenter ever did. Where Mike Myers' nefarious activities were always shrouded in shadows, Friday the 13th gives you gratuitous, in-your-face violence with a head-spinning take on motherhood and an ending that is the mother of all shock reveals till this day. Besides being Slasher's first female antagonist, Betsy Palmer's Mrs. Voorhees oozes eeriness and instability with her very presence. That hollow, dead stare and unnerving fixed grin. Horror icon Tom Savini brought Cunningham's bold vision to life with immaculate makeup work. Just look at a young, pre-footloose fame Kevin Bacon in this grisly scene. Beautiful stuff. Friday the 13th is a landmark film in the history of horror, resplendent in its lunacy and important because of its impact. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 1974. Brutal, sadistic, macabre. Adjectives alone cannot do justice to this classic horror film that give audiences over the world a sizable appetite for violence. Based on the real-life case of the notorious Wisconsin murderer and grave robber, Ed Gein, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre manipulates the beautiful Texan landscape to tell a story of grisly, horrid murder and utter depravity. The chainsaw-wielding, utterly sinister Leatherface is upstaged in his depravity only by his family, whose sadomasochism and thirst for blood, literally in Grandpa's case, unlock a primal fear deep within you. Despite its freakishly violent plot, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a rare case of less gore and more terror. Hooper's clever use of the camera conveys the intended emotion to the audience, allowing their imagination to fill in the terrible gaps. Iconic horror art director Robert A. Burns personally drove around the countryside collecting bones to give the Sawyer house its appalling, viscerally inhuman furniture that is supposed to resemble Gein's own home. We can only imagine that it looked like one of the seven stages of hell from Dante's Inferno, IRL. The psycho-inspired soundtrack layers tension upon its already tense atmosphere, creating the perfect environment for you to scream along with Marilyn Burns' Sally at the sheer prospect of being consumed by a family of crazed cannibals. The Cabin in the Woods, 2012. Joss Whedon and Drew Goddard managed to pull off references to nearly every defining horror movie in this self-aware embodiment of the slasher genre that offers up equal amounts of gags and gore. Dana, Jules, Kurt, Holden and Marty decide to go on a vacation in the titular Cabin in the Woods. Unbeknownst to them, they are being manipulated by a group of underground scientists and government agents who are betting on the peculiar ways in which the teens might die. What ensues is a hilarious borderline parody that is a total upheaval of every slasher trope known to us in one daring act of defiance that taunts the entire genre into growing up. Everything about this film works in contradiction and in conjunction with our understanding of slasher films. And this oxymoronic dissonance is what makes it work. 
The stereotypical group roles are in conflict here. Kurt the Jock is into philosophy. Marty the Fool is actually a smart stoner. The final girl is promiscuous. The list is practically endless. Gary and Steve's organization is forcing the teens to go through the exact structure of a slasher flick, betting on which kind of entity will kill them. Evil Dead's Deadites, Hellraiser's Cenobites, The Shining Twins, or something entirely different. The Cabin in the Woods bolts through its story at a relentless pace, building upon its last punchline with a layer of tension-tinged violence that doesn't let up until it finally crescendos and collapses into itself with a cocksure grin on its face. Candyman, 1992. From the grossly macabre mind of British horror icon Clive Barker comes this ominous tale of vengeful spirits and forbidden love. Yes, love, for all of Barker's work centers on the idea that dualities are, in fact, two halves of the same coin. Pain is pleasure, hell is heaven, and insanity is a mark of genius. This chilling juxtaposition of diametrically opposing concepts is a hallmark of Barker's fiction, evident in his cult classic franchise Hellraiser and this movie. Candyman is Barker's take on the Bloody Mary myth, realized as a biting commentary on deep societal issues like race and taboo subjects, especially sex. At first glance, it feels like your typical slasher movie, the ghost of a man wrongfully killed because of his race, with a hooked hand and a personal vendetta is summoned when you take his name five times while looking in the mirror. When you take off the veil of superficial understanding, Candyman reveals itself to you as a menacing romance that tantalizes your senses by mixing intimacy with intimidation. The Candyman's presence is hypnotic for Helen, literally to hear actor Virginia Madsen say it, and draws her into the sick reenactment of his previous Previous life, where he was killed for loving a white woman. Through Helen, his legend is both validated and propagated, as we see at the end of the movie. The entire movie has an art film aesthetic, tinged with a healthy dose of jump scares and fascinating tension. Tony Todd's hulking presence and a soothing baritone convey the true menace of the Candyman. He is mesmerizing, disorienting, and sinfully addictive, just like the movie. Sleepaway Camp, 1983. Three years after the genre-defining Friday the 13th came out, Robert Hiltzi took us through another camp mystery, albeit the shocking twist in the tale is single-handedly responsible for making Sleepaway Camp a contender to the top 10 camp slashers of all time, which might be a separate list in itself. Wink, wink. Our story follows young Angela Baker, a shy and introverted teenage girl who has a traumatic past and lives with her aunt Martha. Angela is troubled with a capital T. She's submissive, silent, and gets picked on literally all of the time. Seriously, Camp Arawak is not a camping experience we'd recommend. What with the bullying campers and cooks with a rather disconcerting view towards children. Angela's tormentors get their comeuppance, though, in the form of a grisly murder. As a movie, Sleepaway Camp plays out like a calculated horror film that builds layers upon layers of tension and intrigue with some truly OTT death scenes that make it borderline comical. It manages to rope you back in and throw your understanding of the entire story for a spin with its ending that still stands up as one of the most shocking, disheartening and graphic conclusions to a horror film ever. Psycho, 1960. Ah yes, the granddaddy of all horror films ever. If this was a list about movies that defined horror cinema and were closely tied to the birth of slasher films, Psycho would easily be on top. Alfred Hitchcock took Paramount to task for this one, and he ultimately succeeded by creating a masterpiece of visual storytelling that is being dissected by film critics still this day, six decades after its release. Psycho is a cornerstone of the genre, like a Game of Thrones is to fantasy, Dune 2021 is to science fiction, and Scream was to slasher comedies. Except, unlike all of the aforementioned titles, Hitchcock manages to give this proto-slasher flick icon status with no savagery and Hershey's chocolate syrup. Go look it up. Escaped fugitive Marion arrives at a rundown motel to escape the law, but everything goes awry when the proprietor's mother disapproves of her staying there. What follows is an exercise in shock and awe theatre, whose frantic pacing and twist in the end catches every audience member unaware.
Anthony Perkins embodies the essence of the word unhinged with his turn in the film. Many have tried and failed to recreate the unwitting aura of terror that Norman Bates unleashed on the big screen. Bernard Herrmann's excellent score is as integral to portraying Bates' insanity as it is to the film's success. His menacing melodies give Psycho a pervading sense of doom that is hard to shake off, even long after you've seen the movie. Eerie, unnerving and utterly disturbing, Psycho is a timeless gem that has served as a direct inspiration for generations of filmmakers and slasher movies alike. High Tension 2003 this 2003 offering from Splat Pack member Alexandre Aja is a love letter to 70s and 80s slasher flicks set against the beautiful backdrop of southern France. Best friends Mari and Alex visit the latter's parents' house for the weekend to study and have a sleepover. Their innocent plans turn into a gig their innocent plans turn into a deadly game of survival when a serial killer attacks Alex's home, murdering her parents and giving chase to Alex and Mari. Alex ends up getting captured by the killer and Mari pursues them trying to rescue her best friend. The ending of High Tension is one of the most jarring exhibitions of the unreliable protagonist being played out on screen. True to his affiliation, Alexandra ensures that the action takes center stage in the film. The gruesome death of Mari's father is just the first in a string of graphic murders that fueled this gothic European gore fest. The death of the gas station owner is Alexandra's homage to that iconic scene from The Shining. With every passing minute, the tension keeps rising, with a stellar first hour that races by. The twist in the end might be cheesy for some, but the sheer terror of the reveal was enough to make us renounce love for a long, long time. Mind-numbingly violent and sickeningly freaky, High Tension brings out the bloodier side of the new French extremity movement to a mortifying effect. <laughs> The Prowler, 1981. Joseph Zito is remembered in horror circles as the man who helmed Friday the 13th for the final chapter, but his foray into the genre came with 1981's The Prowler, a decent by-the-book slasher flick that entertains without offending aficionados. The movie begins with the all-too-familiar setup of the first dance in dash years. The spiteful serial killer, in this case the titular Prowler and his pitchfork of doom, embark on a spree of teenage murders that showcase some of Tom Savini's most blood-curling horror effects to date. Seriously, go watch that opening kill and then watch every kill because they are all so good. It is pure slasher indulgence, with Savini himself considered it to be his best work, period. The premise had an inherent undercurrent of tension because the idea that a World War II US war veteran could be an ethereal serial killer was a big no-no back in the 80s. The commentary on the mistreatment of enlisted soldiers sets the bloody stage for savage retribution that ends with the tip of the hat to carry. Hello, Amanda. You don't know me, but I know you. I want to play a game. Saw 2004 do you want to play a game? These days, he's directing big-budget blockbusters like Furious 7 and Aquaman. But splatback OG James Wan started off his career with Slasher, where Insidious and Conjuring use overtly supernatural elements to invoke fear. His debut film slices away at the very fabric of morality. Saw centers around two men, Adam and Lawrence, trapped in a dilapidated bathroom with a dead body in their midst, a bag with two hacksaws and a creepy tape recorder. The recorder had instructions for them. Lawrence must kill Adam before 6 p.m. or his family will die. Lawrence immediately recognizes the man as the jigsaw killer, a sadistic serial killer with a twisted sense of morality who tests his victims' wills through these games. What happens next is a medley of lunacy, hysteria and cold-blooded violence. Graphic, incredibly tense and gruesome with its skills, Saw's originality and unique mystery thriller vibe pointedly carries you through its 103-minute runtime, delivers immensely on the mystery Saw and gives you one of the best closing shots in a slasher flick ever. No, 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 no. 
The Burning, 1981. If Halloween set down the template for slasher films, then Friday the 13th gave it its spiritual home, filling drive-ins and grindhouses with gory, unhinged B-movies, defiling the good name of summer camps in the name of shock and value entertainment. 1981's The Burning, however, was a cut above the rest. It lures you into a sense of false security with its first half that plays out almost like a summer camp comedy, complete with elaborate, heart-stopping pranks that foreshadow some of the characters' fates. Playing on real-life New York City urban legends, the film's leading antagonist is Tropsy, a deranged burn victim who was presumed dead and has now returned to terrorize Camp Stonewater and his promiscuous, bullish prop of campers. It's a classic 80s gore fest, restrained in the first act and unleashed in the second. Our favorite scene has to be when Cropsy attacks an entire raft full of teenagers with a pair of gardening shears. Comical? Yes. Graphic? Iconic? Without a doubt. Scream 1996 Do you like scary movies? An iconic line from an iconic film that single-handedly revived slasher flicks in the 90s while taking constant jabs at the genre in a sort of self-aware game of survival and ghastly teenage humor. Wes Craven's contributions to horror are foundational, so it only makes sense that he would be the one to thoroughly deconstruct them. And yet, at no point does Scream feel anything less than a visceral symphony of violence. The crossover cast features inspired performances from all players, including a bitchier than Monica Courtney Cox, the affable David Arquette and Drew Barrymore for the most memorable opening kill of all time. The protagonists are well aware of the do's and don'ts of a horror movie and yet actively choose to engage in them anyway. From drinking to getting it on to saying, I'll be right back, their smug self-assurance is thrown in their faces with some of the most gut-wrenchingly bloody knife work in 90s cinema. Craven's ghost face killer is both a trivia question and answer for horror diehards who know what he'll do before he does it and are still left horrified by his sheer savagery. Smart, sensual, and funnier than it has any right to be, Scream marks a crucial turning point in the history of horror, arriving at a time when the slasher genre had become stale and becoming its sole saviour. My Bloody Valentine 1981. There's a movie for every festive occasion in existence. Christmas, Halloween, and Thanksgiving have a litany of horror movies attached to them. But we have to admit, we really love this cheesy Valentine's Day murder mystery. Not that it is much of a mystery, mind you. This movie is an outlandish cross between a teenage rom-com love triangle and a psychological thriller that somehow ended up in a creepy, power to laced mind. And we love every second of it. My Bloody Valentine takes a lot of notes from Friday the 13th. The place and date that it all happened setting. The raunchy teenagers, the vengeful masked killer, and jump scares and blood aplenty. It's a shame that the minor isn't as fondly remembered as Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees because his drip was rad AF. And if you want a real taste of how bloody Valentine's parties and Valentine's bluffs can get, make sure you watch the uncut version released in 2009. Audiences in 1981 who thought this film was gory with all its edits would be rushing out of the theatre if they saw this. There's a scene where our resident maniacal minor turns a copulating couple into a rather morbid spinning top and another victim into a literal faucet. Yikes! Even the ending is queasy to watch as the minor, after being exposed, straight up 127 hours in his hand, stumbling away and yelling out of the title of the movie incoherently as his crazed laughter drops the curtain on the movie. Movie. You're next, 2011. No, not the catchphrase of the famous pro wrestling Goldberg. Although, to be fair, the killers in this movie do use it as their calling card. Your next is an oddball in the horror pantheon. It's a heart racing thriller that is paced at breakneck speed and manages to subvert the biggest trope in slasher films in the most clever way we've seen so far. Erin accompanies her boyfriend Crispin to his home for a family reunion, and things seem fishy from the get go. Matters take a turn for the worse when the family is attacked. In in what seems like a home invasion, but quickly reveals itself as a far more sinister plot. If the story seems familiar to you, hardcore slasher fans, that's because it's modelled after the infamous 1971 Giallo, A Bay of Blood, from the gory deaths to the murderer's motive, right down to the ending of the film. The erratic, impactful camera work conveys brutality in its rawest form. Director Adam Wingard is truly indie at heart and lets his actors improvise a lot of the dialogue in his movies, which ended up giving us exceptional 
moments of black comedy like the crossbow exchange between Crispian and Kelly. Crispian, what do your shoulders have to do with your legs? I'm the fastest. Kelly, he has a fucking arrow in his back. Crispin, stop yelling at me, Kelly. Sensational stuff. Your next spinal girl is actually the best equipped one out of the entire lot, specifically trained in survival tactics to really drive home her unique, trope-subverting existence. Dark, bloody, and comically effective, your next is essential viewing. I know what you did last summer, 1997. Kevin Williamson pulled off the one-two punch of his life with this film. Where 1996's Scream saw his pen systematically deconstruct the slasher genre with a sarcastic, satirical grin, 1997's I Know What You Did Last Summer is a full-fledged slasher movie that evokes the spirit of prom night in more ways than one. Set in the town of Southport, North Carolina, the movie follows the story of four rowdy teenagers, as usual, who are trying to keep a terrible secret hidden from the entire town. That very secret comes back to haunt them in the form of a vengeful, hook-wielding killer whose death threats inspired the movie's title. This movie is memorable for two things, featuring two of the mystery gang and all of the screams ever. Props to Jennifer Love Hewitt and Sarah Michelle Geller for likely bruising their vocal cords, delivering some of the most OTT screams to ever grace the horror genre. Simple yet sadistic, I Know What You Did Last Summer capitalizes off on the buzz generated by Scream in glorious fashion, capping off Williamson's dual of modern slasher icons that pushed the genre into yet another boom period. Intruder 1989 Released at a time when enthusiasm for slasher films was waning, Intruder sees director Scott Spiegel capture the gory essence of the genre and distill it within a singularly odd location, the supermarket. As a long-time associate of horror comedy icon Sam Raimi, who stars in a brief cameo in the movie alongside his brother, Spiegel has more experience drawing laughs with his ingenuity than Scream. He was the co-writer of Evil Dead 2, after all, and responsible for some of Bruce Campbell's most iconic dialogues from it. Fun fact, he's also in the movie in a blink and you'll miss it cameo towards the end. That perception quickly faded away after Intruder hit the screens. The night shift employees of a soon-to-be-closed supermarket are tasked with marking down all their stock in a single night. Cashier Jennifer's ex-boyfriend Craig heckles the employees in his attempts to win her back, but after he relents, they start getting killed one by one. Intruder runs the risk of coming off as a cheap imitation with a half-hearted attempt at conjuring a sense of mystery and obvious red herrings plaguing it. But what it lacks in sincerity, it more than makes up with its goal. It's not baffling to think that this movie has an R rating, considering it has perhaps one of the most graphic slasher scenes of all time. Each kill escalates the stakes of violence, and we are left peeping through our fingers, nauseous at the sight unfolding in front of us. It's a particularly squeamish watch that is made all the more queasy by its immaculate practical effects. <laughs> Terrifier 2016 if you ever needed proof that Pennywise the Clown isn't actually all that bad, Terrifier is your evidence. Director Damien Leone brings his original creation to the big screen in this 2016 slasher that has all-you-can-take buffet of brutal death after brutal death. The movie begins with a chilling suit-up scene that makes Arthur Fleck look sane in comparison. We see the man watching an interview on his TV that features the survivor of a mutilating attack. Two friends. Tara and Dawn leave a Halloween party and head to a pizzeria where they encounter a cheery clown who seems to be into mime art and has a very voyeuristic vibe about him that unsettles Tara. The pair is left stranded when they find their tires slashed and are soon thrust into a cat and mouse chase with that crazy clown. Terrifier is a deliciously malevolent slasher that makes up for its lack of any serious plot motivations with shocking violence and the efforts of a single cast member. David Howard Thornton's performance as Art will knock the wind out of you and stuff it back in with a chainsaw as it stares in your eyes. His animated cartoonish body language only serves to intensify Art's menacing aura as he hacks and slashes his way through the cast with a demented grin stuck on his face. The fact that Art is a mime is never forgotten. He expresses all of his emotions without saying a single word, which has a hypnotizing effect on the viewer. And then there are the kills. Gory somehow fails to do justice to the sheer savagery perpetrated by Art. 
Seriously, this movie is changed the channel's level of depraved and does not do us the courtesy of hiding it. Unsettling, bloody and oh so compelling, Art the Clown is a modern slasher icon and will be remembered as one of the genre's standout villains for years to come. The Funhouse, 1981 there's something supremely unsettling about Toby Hooper's Funhouse that carries the entire movie's shock factor through simple aesthetic, great performances and masterful camera work. Hooper exposes the seedy underbelly of a travelling circus, or carnival as is the case in the movie, and manipulates the environment to weave a deeply unnerving narrative where it is difficult to gauge where the freak show ends and the carnival begins. Our story follows a gaggle of teenagers brimming with chaotic energy who enter the dark ride called The Fun House after the carnival has closed down. It turns out the darkness is hiding more than just scary exhibits, as their night of adventure turns into a quest for survival. It's as if the protagonists have stepped into a literal fever dream and the doobie they sparked up before hitting the show didn't exactly help things. The cinematography of this movie juxtaposes the cheerful nature of a carnival with the macabre backdrop of the film. The magician's star attraction is a gruesome sword act. The funhouse is a spooky ride filled with witches and skeletons and so on. The only thing that outclasses the horribly disfigured face of the deformed creature is actor Wayne Doba's portrayal of it. His frenetic, hyperkinetic energy invoking a deep-set primal fear of the unnatural. The Funhouse is a fun watch, no pun intended, that takes its audience on a thrill ride and often goes overlooked for some head-scratching reason. Oh, legend has it, Billy still lives in these woods, waiting for new guests to cross his path, waiting to get from out of the The Final Girls, 2015. The best way to describe this 2015 meta-slasher flick is if David from Pleasantville was a fan of Scream, had romantic notions like Tom from Purple Rose of Cairo, and a loving relationship with his mother a la terms of endearment. The Final Girls focuses on the titular Final Girls of this 2015 offering, Max Cartwright and her Scream Queen mom, Amanda. The movie begins with a failed audition, where Amanda muses to her daughter, that she seems to be destined to be relegated to slasher movies. Fast forward three years and Max is mourning her now dead mother. She goes to watch her mom's cult classic movie Camp Bloodbath and its sequel with her friends, but the movie theatre is set ablaze and the group escapes by tearing through the screen. Only they have somehow been transported into the movie itself. Over the course of its events, the teenagers try to apprehend the movie's antagonist, Billy, while trying to keep all other characters alive through extreme and often hilarious means. Despite its fourth wall shattering narrative, the final girl retains enough elements of the slasher genre to qualify it as one, especially the countless outrageous stripping scenes that attempt to lure the killer towards our self-aware protagonists. Funny, gruesome and oddly heartwarming at the same time, this movie will remind you that though the source material might be intense, most slasher flicks aren't to be taken as seriously as they make themselves out to be. Or perhaps they are. <laughs> Maniac 1980 The trick to make a movie play out as intended isn't as contingent on the background score or the acting. It's the atmosphere that it generates with its visual aesthetic that sells it to the audience. By that metric, Maniac is an ugly, voyeuristic watch whose creepy, stalker-like aura captivates and reviles us simultaneously. Shot entirely in guerrilla style and without permits, the movie has this air of unsettling sleaze about it that carefully builds itself into the narrative and the characters' backstories. Not since 1960's Psycho have you met a man so grotesquely hung up on his mum's transgressions, and the comparisons with Norman Bates do not end there. Joe Spinell's Frank Zito is a violent enigma, a greasy, schizophrenic man whose perversions are too mortifying for mere mortals to behold. We see the movie through him and are forced to ask in his gruesome lunacy as he debases women and dresses mannequins with their hairs, talking to these inanimate ladies like he's at daycare and in need of a hot chocolate. It is possibly Spinell's greatest performance as a leading man, and that alone makes it worth a watch. Of course, no slasher classic is complete without gore, and horror icon Tom Savini executes yet another masterpiece of splatter effects with Maniac, using a point-blank, sawed-off shotgun blast for a particularly grisly scene that even he thinks might have been taking things too far.
Black Christmas, 1974. Bob Clark's beloved A Christmas Story is a staple of our annual Christmas block over on TBS. And given the heartwarming journey that the film is, it absolutely baffles us that the same man who gave us the oh fudge moment created the formative slasher film, the ultimate prototype that came to define an entire genre and still stands up almost 50 years later. Black Christmas. John Carpenter must have been taking detailed notes when he watched this film because a lot of its storytelling elements, verbal and visual, would inspire Halloween. Clark introduces the concept of the killer's point of view here, which lends an air of surreal malevolence to the movie. After all, if you're seeing it through the killer's eyes, surely you must feel their actions just as well as they play it out. Black Christmas is like a guidebook for slasher films. The deranged murderer who's out to right the perceived wrong, the group of hormonal teenagers, a sorority house in this case, the proverbial final girl, it all started here. Another thing that directly found its way into Halloween is the phone call scene, where our final girl's friend gets killed, on call. Hello Olivia Hussey and Jamie Lee Curtis. Clark does a wonderful job of building suspense, revealing only parts of the killer's physical appearance and never disclosing his identity or intentions, thus feeding into the most human instinct there is, the fear of the unknown. Who can forget the sheer terror they felt when Hussey's Jess gets a call from the police station informing her that the obscene calls she's been getting are from inside the house? Black Christmas keeps you locked in your seats, transfixed, as you try to figure out the mystery of the killer's identity all the while squirming in your seats because of all the tension and deaths that take place in front of your eyes. Happy Death Day 2017 Imagine if Phil Connors was being pursued by Ghostface in his time loop. You'd basically be watching a gender-reversed version of what unfolds in this Christopher Landon-directed 2017 slasher comedy, an eclectic mashup of Scream and Groundhog Day Happy Death Day sees us following a day in the life of Teresa, Tree Glebman. Except, at the end of a raunchy, profanity-laced day, she is killed by a masked murderer. Things get bizarre when Tree wakes up and finds herself back in the bed of a one-night stand from the previous day. She's stuck in a time loop and the only thing she can do is die repeatedly in an increasingly funnier and more frustrating fashion. Now she must figure out how to escape the loop and trap her assailant, all the while reliving her past transgressions towards various people and trying to reinvent herself. Granted, as far as slashers go, it's kind of tame, not too gory, not over-the-top violence. In fact, if anything, the deaths escalate into a parody of the genre, almost. What makes this movie so goddamn addictive is Jessica Roth's Lee. Wild, uninhibited, vulnerable and confident at the same time, Tree's multifaceted personality makes you genuinely feel for her, so much so that you actively root for her towards the end. Happy Death Day breezes through its 96-minute runtime with enough sass and chick flick-esque montages that keep you entertained while satiating your bloodlust. Well, kind of, anyway. Freaky 2020 Now this, by Christopher Landon, is a slasher movie. While his last slasher comedy was more of the latter, with Freaky, Landon doubles down on his unique brand of franchise mashups and brings all the gore. Our story is set in the fictional town of Blissfield, with a serial killer who has done his slasher homework. Seriously, in the opening scene itself, he is able to reference Halloween, Friday the 13th and to Scream, while coming up with perhaps the most original opening kill we've seen so far. Remind us not to drink directly from a bottle ever again. Things go all Freaky Friday when the same killer stabs young Millie Kessler with an enchanted knife that causes them to swap bodies. Now stuck in the butcher's body, Millie must figure out a way to get her body back while trying to thwart this mad murderer's rampage. Despite its comical premise, Freaky gets a lot of things right. The gender dysphoric experience that Millie goes through is a real expression of Landon's closeted childhood and the movie handles the subjects of gender fluidity and sexuality with exceptional grace and sensitivity. Not to say it's devoid of massive sassy gay energy. Looking at you Josh, Vince Vaughn and Catherine Newton deliver stellar performances as The Butcher and Millie respectively, effortlessly channeling each other's mannerisms while poking fun at their own physical limitations 
and newfound abilities. And as we've mentioned before, Landon really brings the gore in this film, especially in Mr. Bernardi's death scene, where he recalls fake blood shooting up to the ceiling of the set during filming, which was at least 50 feet high. Funny, endearing and garishly brutal, Freaky is perhaps the most millennial slasher flick of all time, and that is a great thing. Stage Fright, aka Aquarius, 1987. Try as you might, you won't find any giallo out there that is as American as Michael Suave's directorial debut. Before Stage Fright, Suave had been the protege of giallo and horror icon Dario Argento, whose gory contributions to cinema inspired an entire genre across the ocean. As it turns out, the master taught his student well. Stage Fright has all the shocking violence of a classic Argento production, with a fresh script and an intimate setting that allowed Suave's movie to supersede his mentors through sheer suspense and claustrophobia. The movie is set in one location for most of its runtime, a dark, eerie theatre where a troupe is getting ready to perform The Night Owl conducting night rehearsals to perfect their performances. Unbeknownst to them, a psychotic killer has broken in and is planning to turn their production a tad bloodier than expected. The owl-masked killer, Irving Wallace, is genuinely unsettling, showing early giallo levels of enthusiasm for gleeful brutality. Suave's fluid camera work and unique set-piece designs lend an aura of surreal terror to the movie that makes you wish it were phantasmagoric. Though slow-paced at first, stage fright turns downright frantic after the first kill occurs. That visual of the cast members' lifeless bodies being set up around stage is bone-chilling, and just one bead on the string of horrors that is stage fright. <coughs> Behind the Mask – The Rise of Leslie Vernon 2006. If The Daily Show existed in a universe where mainstream horror icons were real, this movie might have been one of their best field pieces, and they've had some doozies over the years. There have been many attempts to replicate Scream's genre-deconstructing hilarity, but this mockumentary-style howler, directed by Scott Glosserman, leaps beyond those comparisons and creates a trope-exposing monolith that has, genuinely, some of the best black comedy bits ever seen in a slasher movie. In Glossoman's universe, notorious serial killers Jason Borges and Freddy Krueger are legends, and not the urban kind. It turns out they were real, and their activities directly led to serial killing becoming a famous occupation in the eyes of one Leslie Vernon. To help immortalize his legend, he allows journalist Stella Gentry and her documentary crew to film him in the days leading up to his final showdown. What follows is a gut-wrenchingly hilarious series of interviews, complete with a training montage that answer some of the most obvious questions one might have after watching a slasher film, such as, how do they always catch up with their victim? Why does the killer never ever seem to die? And are there head-scratchers that receive straightforward answers which inadvertently evoke peals of laughter? Nathan Basil's commitment to the charming, aloof, yet manically impulsive Leslie saves this movie from feeling like a complete parody of the genre. The intensity he shows in certain scenes is pure slasher fear. From start to finish, Behind the Mask is a biting commentary on copycat murderers and slasher movies while being an exceptionally effective one itself. <laughs> Alice, Sweet Alice, 1976. Immediately chilling with his religious iconography, Alice, Sweet Alice follows the story of the titular Alice, the older of two siblings in a family deeply entrenched in Catholicism. Alice is a troubled child who often pranks her sibling because she feels underappreciated. But her harmless play seemingly turns sinister as her younger sister, Karen, turns up dead at her communion. What follows is a classic whodunit that casts doubt over children's innocence and touches upon the dangers of fervent religiosity as well as familial dysfunction. In terms of structure alone, director Alfred Soule has effectively created the most gallio West American movie to date, both in terms of its mystery and shocking violence. At many points in the film, we are forced to ask ourselves, is Alice really mentally unstable? Or is something larger at play here? In terms of its moody, gothic aesthetic and recurring motifs, Soul stated that he drew inspiration from Don't Look Now, specifically citing the yellow raincoat of our plastic masked killer. With a cast of thoroughly debauched characters played to 70s perfection, Alice Sweet Alice functions as a commentary on fanaticism and a gratifying early slasher flick that doesn't have a single frame of disappointment. The 
pieces. Pieces, it's exactly what you think it is. Just the kind of advertising that drive-in and grindhouse regulars love seeing. And believe you us, the movie delivers on this brutally honest tagline. We can't decide if this movie is a sly parody of slasher movies or a superlative expression of one. Either way, director Huan Picker Simon certainly knows how to deliver the gore. We start our story with a rather perverted young man assembling a naughty puzzle. His mother reprimands him, rightly so, and we, the audience, prepare to watch this child get the ass whooping of his life. Imagine our horror, then, when the little psycho gives the Monty Python Black Knight treatment to his own mother, with decidedly fewer laughs. Years later, he re-emerges to terrorize the teenage women of his town. What follows is a disconcerting bloodbath, complete with lost limbs, gratuitous violence, and a jigsaw puzzle that is involved in one of the most viscerally disgusting shockers in slasher history. Filthy and over-animated in every sense of the term, Bruce Ploitation legend Bruce Lee's hilarious take on a kung fu professor is one of the most cartoonish things ever. Pieces will give you a slice of what old-school American grindhouses were about in all their gory glory. <coughs> the Slumber Party Massacre, 1982 what started off as a parody of the slasher genre evolved into an earnest, blood-soaked, power-drill-wielding tale that chips away at your defenses with every kill that occurs. Amy Holden Jones and Rita Mae Brown helmed perhaps the first female-directed slasher movie till that point with pose and purpose, using the antagonist as an allegory for virgin women's fear of intimacy and violence against women. From an aesthetic standpoint, the movie is a total 80s cheese fest, what with the hipster chicks, horny jocks and shocking amounts of nudity. But beyond the skin show lies a very real threat to the girls' lives, in the form of Michael Willella's Russ Thorne, whose sinister, voyeuristic gaze draws out a disgusting sense of violation from your being as he follows his lovers with a weasel-like grin on his face and watery eyes lit up with malice. What brief lines he does have take the tension that already exists to disturbing places. Despite its fairly predictable plot, don't get it twisted. This movie is spine-chillingly unsettling, a thriller ride from start to finish with a bittersweet ending that is rather uncommon in slasher movies. The Hills Have Eyes, 1977 We've talked a lot about Wes Craven on this list, and that's with good reason. The man who's practically synonymous with horror, and slasher movies in particular, having created two of his most iconic franchises in A Nightmare on Elm Street and Scream, but neither film is able to build attention quite like The Hills Have Eyes. Bob Carter and his suburban family are on a road trip vacation to Los Angeles when they stop at Fred's oasis to refuel. The aging Fred urges them to stick to the road, but Bob ignores his ramblings. As if on cue, the trailer crashes in a ditch, which leaves the family stranded in the cold Nevada desert with something evil lurking in the hills. Craven was directly influenced by the Texas Chainsaw Massacre when writing this film, which is evident in its premise and set designs. TTCM art director Robert A. Burns helmed this project as well and recycled several props from the film. That's about where the comparisons end, though. The Hills Have Eyes isn't as much a slasher as it is a philosophical treatise on societal isolation and the innate savagery of mankind. Craven took the Scottish legend of Sawney Bean and spun it to ask the audience the question, where is the line between civilized life and primal barbarity? How thin is it? Throughout the film, we see the Carters stalked like easy prey. They are toyed with, ridiculed and violated at such an unrestrained pace that it's hard to think of them as anything but gore fodder. And yet, by the time the movie ends, we can't really say that the good guys did the right thing. We are not sure, and that is the beauty of this film. It throws morality out of the window and makes you question your very conscience, which is a nuance you won't see repeated a lot over the years. A scintillating slow burner that escalates into a morbid crescendo, The Hills of Eyes is yet another foundational project that helped cement Craven's legacy as a master of horror. Tenebrae, 1982. Does brutal violence require a reason? Or is violence itself a sort of primal instinct that needs to be satisfied in order to maintain our sanity? Tenebrae opens with a narration about finding freedom in taking life. A morbid prospect, but one that has found frequent mention in Giallo legend Dario Argento's movies, and Tenebrae is no exception. 
Peter Neal, an American horror novelist, is visiting Italy to promote his latest work, the titular novel Tenebrae. Neal's stories are rife with graphic violence and misogyny that sell them based on shock value alone. Before they land in Rome, however, a murder occurs that mirrors one of the kills from Neal's novel. Over the course of the movie, we see a gruesome mystery unfold with lives taken, limbs scattered and blood splattered all over the walls, in the case of one particular scene quite literally. Neil and his companions must figure out a way to stop the killings from taking place. This is one of those rare cases where publicity will fail to live up to its reputation of being great all the time. They are left with a grim twist in the tale when they realize apprehending their apparent killer didn't stop the killings. Amidst its gory carnage and buckets of fake arterial spray, Tenebrae tells a chilling tale of psychological breakdowns and how one bad day can shatter your very understanding of life. Morality isn't as black and white as we might tend to think. It's a full-fledged monochrome chart with varying shades of grey. We just happen to swing from one end of the spectrum to the other, but the decision is ours and ours alone and Argento captures those moral crises with a lens that lends an arthouse vibe to this giallo classic. Torso, 1973. Created in the same vein as an Argento or Barber production, albeit with much more restraint, Torso sees director Sergio Martino deliver a more classic Gallio, peppered with elements that would go on to define the slasher genre. Following the deaths of several university students in Perugia, Jane and her friends are thrown into the line of fire when the killer decides to come for them next. He seems to have a particularly gruesome sign-off, removing the movie's namesake from the bodies of young women. Torso is as exploitative as the title sounds, with plenty of nudity and a hedonistic bohemian attitude that gives it an undeniable aura of captivating tension. Martino manages to give even the most lurid of his scenes a certain artistic flair, enough to keep your attention as he lures you in for a thoroughly disturbing ride. The killer's stocking wrapped face with its dead, soulless eyes reaches into your throat and pulls fear out of your mouth. He's got this feral intensity that is as unhinged as a shark that smelled blood in its waters. One particular scene stands out as an early freeze frame moment in slasher history, where our final girl helplessly watches her friends die at the hands of the killer, transfixed in horror and unable to even respond. It is by no means perfect. Martino does need help to step up his foreshadowing game real quick, but Torso is an important watch for any self-respecting slasher stand worth their salt. No. April Fool's Day, 1986. You can either call this movie the greatest practical joke of all time or the worst attempt at parodying slasher movies to date. And honestly, we won't blame you. As the name of the movie might suggest, the teenagers of this screamer are on a vacation during the weekend leading up to 1st April. They arrive at their destination, a private island, and are given the traditional April Fool's greeting by Muffy, Skip's cousin, and the heiress of the island. Muffy plays out a string of practical jokes on the group, some hilarious, some slightly harmful. But as they settle in, they start getting attacked one after the other, and the guests wonder if their host is keeping a dark secret from them, until the movie ends. And then you face the dilemma we mentioned at the start of this entry. Another thing that sets it apart is the gore, or lack thereof. Walton was extremely careful not to turn the movie into a snuff fest, which resulted in it being run multiple times on late night cable blocks and developing a healthy cult following. Regardless of what you might think about the plot twist, go watch it now if you can. It cannot be denied that April Fool's Day has a certain eclectic charm to it that makes it worth watching. Prom Night, 1980. While most slashers, post Michael Myers, tended to commit bloody murder for nothing more than kicks, it wasn't always that way. Many early 80s slasher flicks had a touching story of retribution at its core, which ended up making them all the more disturbing. After all, what does it say about you if you end up sympathizing with a killer? Nowhere is this question more pressing than in this 1980 film that features the original Scream Queen, Jamie Lee Curtis, venturing out into yet another blood-soaked journey that influenced the genre for almost two decades, all the way up to 1997's I Know What You Did Last Summer. Four adolescent friends unwittingly cause the death of one of their friends and vow to never talk about it. Six years later, their past catches up with them, as they are systematically marked for death by an unseen killer who proceeds to exact brutal retribution. 
Prom Night is a flawed film, no doubt about that. Some of the segments in this movie play out with robotic monotony that is due in part to the repetitive structure of most slashers. But where the film is good, it's great. Eddie Benton's Wendy gives the genre one of its most iconic chase scenes still dates, an eight-minute stretch that sees Wendy running for her life through the dingy corridors of a dark romesque high school and putting Curtis to shame with a hysterical screaming. Prom Night is marked by exhilarating highs and deflating lows. Luckily for us, it has enough of the former to bulldoze the latter and give you an entertaining package of surprisingly meaningful carnage. Punish. Silent Night, Deadly Night, 1984. And we round out this list with what isn't perhaps the most memorable Christmas murder movie of all time. But it should be because it gave kids the unvarnished truth about Christmas. Santa ain't real. And even if he is, you should definitely stay away from his naughty list. Five-year-old Billy Chapman is visiting his catatonic grandfather with his parents when the old man suddenly springs into action and warns Billy to be good or else he'll be punished by Santa. See Santa Claus tonight, you better run, boy. You better run for your life. Hours later, his father and mother are gunned down in cold blood by a man in a Santa costume, leaving Billy with deep-seated trauma. Three years later, eight-year-old Billy's horrifying Christmas drawing prompts orphanage handler Sister Margaret to petition Mother Superior for help, which she delivers in the form of grueling punishments, reinforced with puritanical beliefs of good and evil. Fast forward 10 years and a now adult Billy works at a cheer-filled toy store, but Christmas week and an infatuation with his co-worker kick his PTSD into overdrive. The events that take place next are equal parts gut-wrenching and heart-rending. For 45 minutes, director Charles E. Sellier Jr. makes us empathize with Billy and his hardships. After that 45th minute mark, he flips the narrative at a head-spinning rate to create one of the most iconic slasher villains of all time. Billy Chapman is ruthless, psychotic, absolutely primal with his brutality, and worst of all, he is relatable. When it first came out, network executives and critics alike lost their absolute minds over the prospect that Santa Claus could be depicted as something evil. But here we are, almost 40 years after it was released, and Silent Night, Deadly Night still stands up to its reputation as one of the finest slasher movies of all time. The same can't be said about the sequels though, and that is a damn shame. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.